So good evening, everyone, yeah. and welcome. My name is Bren Carlil, and I am the Director of Public Affairs at the Zionist Federation of Australia. Tonight, we have two wonderful guests that I will introduce to you shortly. But first, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I speak, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Knowing that this conversation is being watched in every Australian state, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which people are watching this. Those of you with school-aged children will know that the Jewish day schools are closed tomorrow because the nation's Jewish educators are here in Melbourne attending the ZFA's biennial Jewish Educators Conference. Today was the first of two days. It was also my first experience of the Educators Conference and it has been an absolutely fascinating experience to witness true experts present and grapple with a whole range of issues from technical aspects of teaching to the grand philosophies of Jewish education and identity. And it is this latter focus that we are going to turn to tonight. Our two guests this evening are both visiting Australia from America in order to speak at the Educators Conference. And I have to say that not only are they dealing with jet lag, but they are backing up after a full day of conferencing and eating. So the fact that they have given their time this evening to speak to us all is just so generous. Now, the reason I've convened these two speakers is because I think that what they spoke about at the conference today is too important to be confined to just educators. It has real relevance and importance to the entire Jewish community, and especially anyone in the community with school or university age children. So to introduce our guest, Tal Gale has diverse experience in both formal and informal Jewish education across North America and in Israel. She has a BA and MA in Hebrew literature and Hebrew language instruction from Brandeis University, as well as various postgraduate studies. She served as a program and education director for the Dilatine Fellows Program, where she designed tools to increase program impact and contribute to the field of Jewish peoplehood. And indeed, Tal's work includes publications on the topic of Jewish peoplehood and contributions to the Peoplehood Education Toolkit. In addition to her work, Tal serves on the board of directors of the Council of Hebrew Language and Culture in North America. Joining Tal this evening is Dr. Noam Weissman, the Executive Vice President of Open Door Media. Noam is a recognized thought leader on new paradigms in Jewish education. He is the founder of Lahav, an educational initiative that provides content and technology for Jewish learning and teaching in schools and communities throughout the world. Noam completed his doctoral dissertation in educational psychology from the University of Southern California with a focus on curriculum design. But all of these biographies aside, Noam and Tal know how to educate Jewish youth to be proud of their Jewishness and of their Zionism. And that's what we're going to talk to them about this evening. And the man who'll be doing the talking is Jeff Feldman, the CEO of UIA Victoria. So with no further ado, I am going to hand the mic over to Jeff. Thank you very much, Brian. Welcome, Tal and Noam. Um, I feel somewhat inadequate in moderating this evening's discussion, not being from an educational background, just a mere lawyer who was practicing at that and couldn't, you know, I think in the, the, the phrases in my next life, I'd like to get it right. Um, but welcome to both of you. Thank you for traveling halfway around the world. Um, Hopefully you bring some good weather with you next time you, you, you visit our wonderful shores. Um, Norm, I read your article in the, in the Jewish News and I, I hope you got to catch up with some of those um, Australians who you sang with back all those years ago. Um, I'd like to start off the questions this evening. Tell um, a question for you. This morning in your session, one of the sessions you spoke about the importance of articulating the school's Hebrew mission. Please, can you enlighten us? I don't know how many of the people are at uh, the, the, the event tonight or at the, the conference this morning. Can you enlighten us to, as to why it is so important for a school to articulate the Hebrew mission and how it helps to build and connect students to their Jewish identity, uh, to Jewish culture, to the Hebrew language and to Israel? Uh, first of all, thank you, thank you, Jeff, for having us. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, had a wonderful session this morning. 
And um, uh, it was a wonderful session because of the participants who were enjoying the conversation. I really had the luxury of speaking with uh, educators from schools across uh, Australia and New Zealand. And the topic was Lama Ivrit. Why, why Hebrew? What are we trying to do? Um, there are many reasons uh, for Hebrew, um, to do Hebrew. Um, but very seldom do we find that uh, schools in particular or organizations at large articulate why they are teaching Hebrew. What is the purpose behind it? There are many purposes. Um, so today we discussed the notion that um, answering that question is critical in order to be intentional in how we uh, use our resources and how we use our students' time. I believe that um, we have very limited time with um, these young people. Uh, we have to use every moment um, really uh, to the highest degree. And it is our responsibility as Jewish educators to be very clear on why we're doing what we're doing. I would just add one more thing. When we talk about why, why Ivrit, uh, we also discussed, you know, who has to inform the Lama Ivrit of each one of these organizations? And uh, the, the answer was clear from, um, from the participants that if we want to really have our schools um, express um, our community, uh, the conversations about why Hebrew is relevant needs to come, of course, to the educators, to the school leaders, but we must also engage students, parents, our boards, our community leaders, um, in order to make sure that we are maximizing um, the unique place that Hebrew can really take us to. So uh, I learned a lot from this uh, session, and it was really wonderful to continue to have the conversation about uh, really how to be most intentional in our time, uh, in our precious time with your kids. And can I ask a, a follow-on question? Are there any studies that show that children who have learned Hebrew at school have a closer connection to, to the Jewish heritage and to Israel as adults? So this is it's a very good question. Um, we do know that, we know, we know a few things about Hebrew language. We know that level of Hebrew proficiency does impact uh, connection to Israel and Jewish identity. Um, we've also, there's been a recent study done by the Ross, by Rossoff, um, which Alex Palmson has recently done, which looked at a camp specifically where uh, there were two tracks, one that was specifically in Hebrew and one was uh, in English. Same, uh, and some kids were in one of the two tracks. That study showed this, that showed that the students who were immersed in Hebrew for that summer had an increased uh, relationship to uh, Israel um, and felt uh, that it was a, a more integral part of their identity. So, you know, this is a, it's a, it's a, it's a great question and we continue to try and unpack it, but we are finding, um, we are finding that there is a connection between these two things and that Hebrew is a conduit to um, really um, establishing and, and strengthening those relationships. Thank you, really interesting. Um, Noam, turning to you, um, Open Door Media works with over 50 Jewish schools around the world, including the USA, Canada, South Africa, Israel, Hungary, and also here in Australia. Um, your topic this morning was what Israel education could and should like lo look like today. Um, what do you think, for those of us who, those of us on tonight who weren't at the, at the sessions, when, what do you think it should look like? And what do you see being taught in Jewish schools today? Uh, so, first of all, I also want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with the broader Jewish community here in Australia. I've had a remarkable time here. Uh, it's been a few days here. It's been a total jet lag on the one hand, but also just euphoria to be part of this community and to uh, to, to engage with, with, with this community, which has so much grace and so much kindness. And so I just want to thank you for giving giving us this opportunity. Uh, and, and I felt that in, in my sessions today, and I felt that with working with Australia for the last few years. One just minor correction, we, we work with over 1,700 educational institutions. Um, I got it from your website, sir. <laughs> so, <laughs> so over 1,700, what we do is we, 
We also have deep relationships with 70 day schools that we have a collaborative and then 30 or so uh, congregational schools. So on top of the 1700. So we work with it. The, the, we do a ton of work across the globe with Jewish schools pretty much everywhere. We're in 65% of all English speaking schools that we've identified across the globe. And so we, we do a tons of work with all of these different institutions and to, to various degrees, so, some more, some less. Uh, there's, it's a broad question, you know, my background is curriculum design. And, you know, even when I was running a school in Los Angeles, I was very focused on curriculum design. I'm a big believer that curriculum creates culture in a school when it's done right and done well. And so what I would say is broadly speaking is Israel education, what, 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 what I think needs to happen if we want the results that we're claiming that we want to have, right? And the results that we're claiming that we want to have is that when they get to campus, they feel confident. We're claiming that what what we're that what we want is to make sure that these young people um, have a strong enough Zionist identity that when they're in the business world, they're not thrown off by the what's referred to as May in the world of Israel education, which means the conflict from May 2021, and they're not thrown off. Right. So if we're serious about that, if we're serious about that um, and we don't want just a, a quick fix, a shortcut, then what that means is that Israel education needs to reside in many more than just one educator. And Israel education needs to reside um, across the school. Uh, Israel education needs to be happening in, in all different forms, in informal or experiential education, formal education. And then the methodology of the Israel education needs to be done in a way that we know works with this kind, with this, with this generation, and to not engage in, I would say, bad habits from from fifteen to twenty years ago that we developed at a very different time uh, when Israel education pro perhaps needed to look different at that point in time. But now in twenty twenty two, there's a we need to have a new approach, and uh, so it's both quantity and quality. Now, I know earlier today you mentioned that um, educators can focus too much on Israel's conflicts. Um, could you give us an example of, you know, could you talk about you know, how to give a broad spectrum of, uh, in, in terms of educating students on Israel? How can we avoid these mistakes? So I would say I, I wouldn't want to avoid the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I think the Israeli-Palestinian conflict needs to be part of the discussion. But it needs to be part of the discussion in the same sort of way, to use an analogy, I spent a decade teaching Tanakh and a decade teaching Talmud. Uh, the way I would teach Tanakh and the way I would teach Talmud is I wouldn't just immediately teach, uh, you know, the first grade I saw, oh, okay, it's talk, the binding of Isaac. How do we deal with the conflict of morality and divine command? And which one yields when divine command collides with morality? How do we go about making that decision? Students, tell me the answer. What's the answer? To me, that's the parallel of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, right? Let's learn how Parshanut HaMikra works, how e biblical exegesis works. Let's think about the different methodologies of the different Rishonim. Let's understand the language structure of the Tanakh. Let's have an appreciation for Tanakh as a whole. So now take that approach and utilize that, manipulate that, mimic that for Israel education. Of course, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict should be taught. Of course, we should learn about the Shtachim, the settlements, um, we should learn about the area A, B, and C. We should talk about different of the of the challenges between the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that we know about, the different opportunities, different missed opportunities. Of course, we should do that. And, and there's the word, and we should learn about the history and the philosophy of Zionism. We should understand that there are different modalities and different types of Zionism. We should understand the context of the history of Israel in general that's not just about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Right. So what that means is that it's part of the discussion, but it's not the part of the, but we're not obsessed with it when we, and then when we teach that, this is my take on it, right? That when we, when we teach the Palestinian Israeli conflict, then there's a methodology to teach that. So it's both, again, it's about thinking really seriously about how much time when we're teaching about Israel, that we're teaching about the sikhsukh, the conflict, and how much time we're talking about the romance, the philosophy, the history, the story of Zionism, and seeing all the different, the interplay of history and culture and civics and, and, and language that makes up the story of the modern Jewish person. Thanks, Noah. Um, 
I'll, we'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later, but I, I just wanted to um, turn to Tal again. Um, in this morning's educator session, you spoke about visual literacy. Um, one of your other sessions was about visual literacy. Now, I recall Daniel Kahneman's book, um, Thinking Fast and Slow, where he described that the brain works in two systems, your intuitive system and your cognitive system. And there's this constant tussle between the two. Um, and the intuitive system, you show somebody a, an image and intuitively you understand what the, what, what's going on. Whereas you try and teach someone language, visual, uh, well, you teach someone language, the cognitive system has to be engaged and it takes time to work through and process. So how do we harness teaching Hebrew visually and effectively so we get children to, this, to a stage where they can engage and communicate effectively in Hebrew? It's an, it's an, it's an excellent uh, question. Um, it was a very uh, engaging conversations with a lot of educators uh, this afternoon. Um, I think one of the questions that we were raising is, you know, what is a text? Um, and, and it also went back to uh, Lama Ibrit. You know, if, if our goal is to really um, both um, increase uh, the, flu the proficiency of our students to increase the affinity to Hebrew and to infuse them in a Hebrew speaking environment, um, when we are working with students who have um, low levels of proficiency, we have to be mindful of that. Not everyone can read uh, Agnon. Not everyone um, has the facility to, um, for one reason or another, um, to, to have access to as many of the sources that we uh, tend to look to uh, to build on language. The, the amazing thing about visual literacy, well, one is 90% of the information that we receive is, uh, is visual. Um, so that, that is how we actually interact in today's world. And I believe, uh, I have to look at the exact data, but um, we are receiving significantly more information than we did five, 10 years ago uh, in a very different pace. So our, what we need to be doing as educators is actually looking at um, uh, how are we communicating in this world? And um, literacy, which once was known to read and write, um, today is understood to be a, a series of ways of communication techniques that all of them collectively allow us to engage in the world um, effectively. So you have uh, digital literacy, which I'll talk about tomorrow. You have visual literacy. All of these are ways that we um, engage. Um, and Hebrew um, should be part of that conversation. One of the things we want to make sure that we're doing is that we're not leaving Hebrew in the classroom. Um, that Hebrew lives within uh, that period and within those four walls. Um, how do we uh, use visuals? Um, I would say that one of the leverage, one of the um, most effective uses of uh, visual literacy is really that you can teach Hebrew and teach other things. You can teach critical thinking. When we're looking at um, information in different ways, uh, we don't need to be doing it in, in English specifically. In fact, uh, to some degree, working from a text that's visual really allows us to explore um, ideas, allows us to interact with texts. And so one of the uh, participants in today's session, uh, we, had a, we had a dialogue about, you know, can a text be something other than, does it have to be words? Um, and our, and our um, conclusion, I believe, was a text is something that you can engage with, that you can um, have a relationship with, and that you can use it to express who you are. I think the, the notion of visual literacy is just to is really to expand the way we take information in. Um, it's a reflection of what's happening in our in our world today. This is how we are uh, where we are working, uh, especially uh, the young people that we are working with. Um, and it's a wonderful way, specifically in second language acquisition, to work with people who have a slightly lower level of proficiency. Um, to allow them to produce in the language, even though they may not have a lot of um, uh, facility in the language. So it's a wonderful way to really explore a uh, language, but also culture, comparisons between cultures, um, connections between cultures. Um, there's a lot of, um, it's, 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 a, it's an entry to the world. Hebrew, Hebrew is not only Hebrew, Hebrew is the world. There's science in Hebrew, there's math in Hebrew. Um, and I think that uh, visual literacy, there's art in Hebrew, we can discuss art in Hebrew, and that's part of the goal is to make Hebrew not so compartmentalized, 
but to see Hebrew as part of the way we interact with the world and the way that we communicate. And that includes visuals, technology, as well as reading and writing. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's, I, I come from an interesting background. Um, my, my Judaism and Yishkite has grown over the years. Um, and thank goodness my children have really embraced uh, um, Judaism and, and, and Yiddishkeit. Um, but you know, um, we've got a, a comment from Maureen Ravia, connection to Judaism and Israel comes from the home. And it's something that I firmly believe that a school can only reinforce what happens in the home. A question to, to both of you, um, maybe Tal, if you could answer first, what are the most important issues facing Judaism and Jewish education globally today? That's uh, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> I I will say I just want to comment for a minute on on Maureen. Maureen, um, uh, school is a, a, a wonderful place for education, and um, it is not a replacement for what's being done in the home and the the importance of um, uh, having these conversations within within the household. I mean, it, it, this. Uh, Parents are partners, schools are partners, um, and our students should be our focus. So I 100% agree that to do our work well, this, this is a community effort. Um, to be a Jewish parent today is uh, not a small feat, uh, and it takes a lot of time and energy. Um, and if we do it seriously, we're not uh, depending on the schools to do this for us. I 100% I, I agree. Um, can you repeat the second, your big question one more time? <laughs> um, yeah, so um, what's the, what are the most important issues facing Judaism and Jewish education globally today? I suppose let, 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 yeah. Yeah. Judaism is, is a far broader uh, topic than this evening, but, but Jewish education, what are the biggest challenges and the biggest issues that, that you see in there? So I think that uh, what I want to say is the fact that we're discussing challenges, to me, is a, a sign that we are in a good place. Um, the fact that we can look at our systems and try to see where there are weaknesses and try to strengthen them means that there's something right in the work that we're doing, that we're secure enough, that we can be critical of the work that we're doing, and that we can be uh, intentional. So I just want to say the fact that there are challenges, and the fact that we're raising them, and the fact that we're opening conversation, to me, is a reflection of the strength of Jewish education today. Um, that said, I would say, um, and again, I, uh, I, I come with a, a perspective that at the end of the day, we don't need to worry um, in Hebrew for, I, I, don't fear, I don't fear for Hebrew. She's been with us for 4,000 years and she will continue to be with us. What we don't know, and this is where we need input. You know, I think the more what we, the more input we can get from all of us, uh, the thought that we are a Jew, that we're not a Yudit, we're a Jewish people. The more we can get those voices out there, uh, the more we can leverage the the different aspects of Judaism, Hebrew, and anything that we bring to the table, and see ourselves as one, and learn from each other. Um, so I think that the biggest challenge is really to let voices be heard. Um, I think the voices that I think need the most uh, help right now are the voices of our students. Um, they have a lot of insight that I think that we could, uh, or in that direction that we think we need to be listening to. Um, and so I would say that um, just making sure that we're listening uh, and we're listening to everyone and we're looking at our work holistically. Uh, again, if Noam, you know, you know, Noam mentioned something about, you know, we need to be clear on what we want our outcomes to be. If our goal is to be a, a global Jewish people, then we need to be taking actions to make sure that that is in fact what we're doing and that we're making room at the table for all of the voices. Um, and that and that and that's not that's hard. Um, but I, I will say that um, it is conferences like the one we're uh, participating in, you know, these two days that give me hope. Um, that we're in the right direction. Um, the fact that we are struggling, the fact that we are raising challenges and the fight that we are not uh, at where we're learning 
tells me that uh, we're actually in a relatively secure place, knowing that uh, there's so much dedication to deal with this. Thanks. No, Noam, um, from your perspective, um, being involved with so many schools um, globally, um, challenges facing Jewish education? Yeah, that's a, that's a gigantic question, and I was thrilled that Tal uh, got the, to answer that first. Uh, so I, I'd say, um, you know, I could go with answers like literacy, uh, Hebrew language literacy, um, knowledge, Tanakh, Talmud, you know, the sea, the Yam Shal Talmud, it's the sea of Talmud. There's so much to learn. Uh, I would say what I really view is, and maybe this is my my bias and what I'm what I'm trying to do at Open Door Media with all of our content on YouTube, on Spotify, and TikTok, Instagram, our films, our curricula. It, it's it's how do you because I'm trying to be like meta about what it is that we're ultimately trying to accomplish here. What are we trying to accomplish as a Jewish people? Are we or are, is what we're trying to accomplish to you know I'm going to be provocative for. for for a reason here are we are we trying to prevent intermarriage is that what we're doing here or what are we trying to really accomplish is it is it is it really just about survival is that what we're trying to accomplish to make sure that the next generation exists to me that's a very unromantic way to view uh jewish life it's a and, and it's and it's um and i think it 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 limits uh what judaism could really provide uh for the for the jewish world and then and for the broader world and, and what I what I think emerges is that what we really want to be accomplishing is teaching our young people how to uh, love their people without being excluding of other people. We want to teach our young people how to defend our people without um, hurting other people. We want to teach our young people uh, to care deeply about Am Yisrael and to be amazing citizens for the for the broader world and to be an orlegoyim. We want our young people to be particularistic and care about uh, amiyut, Jewish peoplehood, and to be universalistic and, and know how to go out there and to be part of the broader world. I, I think that, that that for me is ultimately the goal of Jewish education. And I, and I say that, by the way, not just from uh, the lens of some that grew up modern Orthodox or um, you know, who's been, you know, in the, the community setting very often in the reform conservative world, the Sephardic world. It's, I, I really think that this is an idea, an ideal of Judaism that, that crosses all of those boundaries and, and, and transcends each of our denominations. And I think we could all, I, I mean, I, I'd love to have an interesting debate with someone as to why that wouldn't be the goal for the Jewish people. But when we look at Jewish history, I think that this is a very noble cause if we could utilize the language, utilize the literacy that we have to develop that. And there's a word that, that I haven't said yet, but I, but I want to say it. it's a word that in America, the Jewish community is incredibly uncomfortable with, uh, God. I, I, think that, um, I, I think that very often Jewish uh, education is more anthropocentric than it is theocentric. What I mean by that is we often put human beings at the center of the Jewish and religious experience, but, but God is kind of on the side. I think that we, we have to do more to, to invite God into the conversation. And, and I think that that's something that I think regardless of which denomination or regardless of which uh, school or synagogue we all belong to, I think that we have to figure out how to invite God back into the conversation. So that those are the broader and, and develop a real relationship with God. So those are the broader those are the broader elements of what I think that regardless of what our backgrounds are, all of us could be utilizing the resources and the assets. Everyone can bring their assets to the table in Hebrew language, like Tal works on digital media. You know that I and my organization work on, and we all enter this ecosystem. We bring it all together. We bring our assets to the table, and then we say, "Okay, now how do we have a healthy and thick Jewish identity? One that is not uh, does not suffer from an inferiority complex, and and one that does not, you know, you know, hurt people, hurt people, right? So, and one that that, that does not, you know, uh, kind of become overly defensive, and then as a result, also utilize all of these assets that we bring to the table to develop a real connection with the divine." 
I, I just want to know if you had a quick look at my questions beforehand, because that leads really beautifully into my next question. Um, and I'll just introduce it with a little bit of a story. Um, a couple of years ago, my, my I have two children, a son and a daughter. My son was um, in Israel on a gap year. My daughter was in year nine at uh, Mount Scopus. And I said to her, why don't you invite a few friends over with the Sharut Leomi girls? Um, let's give some of her friends a, a, a lovely Shabbat experience. Um, obviously, with, with the Sharutis, it's always a, a lot of fun having them around. And I thought, okay, you know, we live in a, I live in an observant home. Um, I'm having the Sharudis over for Shabbat dinner. I've got some girls who may or may not have had the experience of, um, of a, a traditional Shabbat dinner. I thought I should do the right thing and give a short Dvar Torah. And um, I, I looked at the Pasha of the week and it happened to be Pasha Ha'azinu. And I was looking through the Pasha for some, some bit of inspiration as what I could tell these, these young girls. And I came across some words that I thought were incredible. In, in Parashat Hazina, you has the phrase Chazak Vermatz. Now, people on the Zoom tonight will know that Chazak Vermatz is the, is the Mount oh, Scopus school, school motto. So I said to the girls, who knows this phrase? Of course they all do. What is it? Oh, it's a Scopus motto. Well, where does it come from? You could hear a pin drop. And I said, well, actually, it comes from this week's Pasha. And what is the context of this phrase? And the context of this phrase is Moses is handing over power to uh, uh, leadership of the Jewish people to Joshua. And they're about to enter into the promised land and they're going to be faced with challenges. They're going to have to fight wars. They're going to be challenged in their identity. And they're going to have to overcome a lot of challenges and hold on to their Jewish identity. And these young girls who are at my Shabbat table, I said, you are the future generation, the future leaders of our Jewish community. You are living in Australia, um, a fairly secular environment. It's, it's challenging for you to hold on to your identity. And in the 21st century, it's, it's a challenge to hold on to your identity as a Jew and, 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 and your, your belief as a Jew. So coming to the, to the question, I know it's, it's a fairly long introduction, but I have this view that the secular world has divorced many religious or spiritual rituals from their origins. You know, for many uh, Christi in Christianity, Christmas is no longer about the birth of Jesus. It's about giving gifts. Um, my pet peeve, Halloween, and you'll forgive me because it's an American holiday that's been imported here, <laughs> um, is really, it, it, it's a Christian festival remembering the dead. But now it's simply about dressing up and going trick-or-treating and, and getting lollies and chocolates and sweets. So given that it is the Torah that has sustained Jewish civilization for so long, is there a danger that Jewish education divorced from the Torah risks the sustainability of the community? So... Happy for either of you to answer. I know it's been a long introduction to the question. I mean, uh, this time so, I'll let Milan go first. <laughs> okay. Uh, do, do I think that uh, Jewish education devoid of Torah learning is sustainable? Is that it risks, the it risks the sustainability of the community? I don't know the answer to the question. Um, I could tell you some some thoughts that I have on that. Um, looking at the last hundred or so years, I think that what we're seeing in in Medinat Israel with people like Ruth Calderon and, and others who are trying to figure out a way to provide a Jewish language that is um, deeply secular on the one hand and also deeply textual. And um, I, I think that there's 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 a there's religiosity with, within that. So when you when you look at, I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here, but I think it's it's at least a little interesting. So if it's a tangent that's interesting, I hope that's okay. The Sama Rebbe, um, Reveal Teitelbaum, was a famous anti-Zionist. Uh, um, does that make him an anti-Semite? Uh, um, no, right? But he, he was a big, big, big anti-Zionist, famous, famous for that, right? 
And he, he, I would say his primary issue with Zionism was actually something that the early Zionists would acknowledge as being true, which is that they wanted to create, like Jabotinsky said, a, ge a geza psychologi chadash al yehudi. They would say things like, like, like Brenner would say things like, "Anachnu adora charon shal yudim, adora ishon shal evrim." That we were, the, we're, the, we're the, uh, sorry, I didn't translate the first line. The, a, a new psychological breed of Jew, said Jabotinsky, and and um, and and people like Brenner and um, and um, and Berdachevsky would, would would really speak about um, becoming a, a new generation of, of shedding this old Jewish identity. And there was there was a real um, there was a real tension between the old Jew and the new Jew, and and people tend to think of Teitelbaum's issues with Zionism as being based on you know uh, Talmudic passages, whether redemption needs to precede repentance or vice versa, or the issue of the three oaths and Masechet Kitubo. But broad, I think that when you actually look at Teitelbaum's issue, it's actually acknowledging something that the Zionists, early Zionists, wanted which was to shed themselves of the old Jew, of the Jew that they, they, were, they were governed by two different realities. They were governed by the Gentile, and they were governed by, um, by God. And they wanted to remove both of those from, from, from their, it was very cumbersome, and they wanted to create something new. And the state of Israel, I think we have to remember, is a result very much so of this early Zionist thought, and that the that the early Zionist pioneers and heroes were very much so, you know, about that. Now that's changed a lot in the last, you know, 30 to 40 years in Israeli society. But I, I, I do think it's possible that you could have a really strong um, national identity. What I do think is also true, though, is if you only have a national identity, not a religious identity, or if you only have a religious identity and not a national identity, I think that no matter what you're going to be losing something as the uniqueness of the Jew. The Jew is not, I mentioned this in my one of my talks today, the Jew is not French, a Frenchman, the Jewish the Jew is not a German, the Jew is not a British, the Jew is not a Christian, the Jew is not a Muslim. Those are religions and those are nationalities. Judaism is very unique in that it combines both a national element and a religious element, right? We're not a religion exclusively, we're not an ethnicity or a culture exclusively, we're certainly not a race. But to be a Jew means to combine all of those. So I would say my answer, Jeff, to that question is, I, I, I wonder what the sustainability of the Jewish people would be without Zionism, without the national element, and reclaiming that and resurrecting this language, which is what we did. We, the Zionism was about you know, moving the, the Jew from a question mark into an exclamation point. That's what Zionism was about, establishing. And so, so Zionism did that and did that really well and really powerfully. So I think that without that national element, there's something really lost. And without this religious element of having something from the Torah, something that is, you know, that, that, that to, to use a chara'am kind of language, where, where religion is not meant to coerce, religion is meant to influence, religion is meant to create something uh, positive and help guide you and help galvanize the people, then, then, then that's a wonderful thing, and for many, many, many people. So that's the way I view it. This, 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 this dialectic of religion and nationality coming together to be one people, and you, and and if you're missing one or the other, then you're missing a, a core element of what it means to be a Jew. Thank you, Noah. So, I, I would just, uh, as someone who deals in language, um, I would invite us to uh, unpack some of the terms, like un unpack what Torah means, unpack what Ivrit means. Um, Torah means different things for different people, uh, and that's okay. And the same thing for Ivrit. I can speak about Ivrit for a second. Like when I say Ivrit, there's modern Hebrew, there's Mishnaic Hebrew, there's biblical Hebrew, there's Tefillah Hebrew. Um, those are all Hebrew. And I would, I would I'd like to extend that way of thinking to the Torah, uh, in the sense that the Torah belongs to everyone, and some people experience it as a uh, uh, historical document that some see it as part of their history, some people see it as part of their, the way they see the world, some people as part of religion. Um, I don't think you can extricate 
uh, either one, I don't think we should, and I don't think you can extricate it. I think that uh, the con, I, I think that um, it would be wonderful if we can, the answer is we need both. Um, but I think we also need to um, look at the language that we're using and ask and ask questions. When you say Torah, what do you mean? When I say Torah, what do I mean? And I, I'm quite certain that we will find a more middle ground once we understand that it can be many things to many people, just like Ibrit. Um, so it would be, uh, I don't think it's possible to extricate it. Uh, I just think we need to uh, make sure that we are looking at the, the really the breadth of, uh, of Torah in this particular instance and what it brings to the Jewish people, to all the Jewish people, and to allow people to access, much like we want people to access Hebrew from different places. Not everyone's going to connect to modern Hebrew. Not everyone's going to connect to biblical Hebrew. I would say the same thing about the Torah. The Torah belongs to all of us. Um, we need to uh, we need to find those connections. I think as educators, uh, the best thing we can do is help our young people find their entry points into um, these uh, fundamental pieces of who we are as a people. So it's not Torah, yes or no. Ezo Torah, Matai Torah, when Torah. Um, and so I think that uh, yes, and we need to practice. Um, doing it. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a little bit of a controversial question, but um, I think we, we, we all know, we all, in, in, in Australia, we have a, a view of the American Jewish community. Um, earlier this year, UIA hosted Daniel Gordas as an online speaker. And in Daniel's view, he sees Jewish identity in America today developing to something that is a politic rather than a religion. So my question is, what, what are the main problems with Jewish and Israel education in America? And what lessons can we in Australia learn from America to have better outcomes in Jewish education here? Noam, if um, I'm not sure, could you tell me what what Daniel means? Uh, uh, colleagues with Daniel, but I want to know what what he meant by it's it's a politic and not a religion. What does that mean? Um, I suppose it's more of a, of, a, of a cultural affiliation rather than um, a religion and a combination of religion and an, and a nation. It's more of a cultural affiliation these days. You know, I I don't I don't know that that's true. Um, I, I think that, um, that, you know, I, 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 I know where Daniel's coming from by, by suggesting that the, there is certainly within the American Jewish landscape, there's just such a broad swath of how different communities and different organizations and different schools, um, cultivate their Jewish identity. So for some institutions and for some communities, they focus much more on culture or they focus more on the, the, the social justice aspect of this. You know, I don't want to give away too much, but from tomorrow's session, one of the things I'm going to be doing, here's a little commercial. Um, one of the things I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be looking at seven different Jewish priorities a, in the Jewish world and asking the, the, the classroom, as it were, to rank these different Jewish priorities. What matters more? Culture, Jewish identity, Jewish education, um, you know, protecting against anti-Semitism. So I, I find that when I engage people in America in this conversation, that it's not the case that people exclusively talk about tikkun olam, maybe that's what he's referring to, or, or you know, or, or, or social justice. I think that's a part of the Jewish world. Um, and again, there's a part of the Jewish world that doesn't even think about tikkun olam b'chala at all. So like, it's, I, I don't, I don't know how to, you, you could look at the Pew studies and to see what's going on in, in the American Jewish landscape. And of course there's reason. And, you know, I, I, I don't like when the Orthodox community, even though broadly speaking, that's my community. Uh, I don't like when there's an, there's like this, there's self-congratulations 
about what's going on in the Orthodox in, in the Orthodox Jewish world in America, and everyone else outside of the Orthodox Jewish world um, is there to kind of dwindle eventually, such that you know, the Orthodox Jew was gonna is gonna land on top. I think we have to be really careful about that approach. I think that there's been an incredible amount that uh, secular Jewry has uh, has contributed to the Jewish world, conservative reform Jewry, reconstructionist Jewry, and and I don't want to I don't want to take away from that at all. Um, so I, I don't know what it means. Uh, I don't know exactly what Daniel means by that, um, but that's my sense of what he, what he's referring to. And I, the one thing that that I will that I'll defend on that point, and I spoke about this a little bit today, is I don't think that Australia should be importing. There are great things for the United States that to, that that the United States exports, like really great things that the, the States exports, like goods. I don't think that that Australia needs to be importing the political conversation that's going on in the United States of America within the Jewish community. Uh, I, and I think that um, if there's one thing that we could you know, one of one of the things that we have to learn how to do significantly better in the American Jewish world is to learn how to disagree with each other um, without maligning the other, without painting the other as as less than, and without going into ad hominem attacks. So that's a very difficult thing because it requires us to look at the facts on the ground and to to be critical thinkers and to analyze and to debate. Um, and uh, so that's that's the way that's the way I do it. I think that you know the, the, there there are great things that the American Jewish community has has brought to the world. I think that you know we have some great Australian funders, for example, at, at Open Door Media, who wants to make sure that there's broad uh, Jewish learning and Israel education for the world. I think so much funding comes from the American Jewish world, and I think that it's important to make sure that the that all of the funding comes from the, the all the different areas uh, across the globe that's the way that's the way I, I really view this conversation about uh jewish education and what to export and what to, what to import it's 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 there uh, there there are great things about the american jewish uh, educational experience and there are things that, that are not great about it and I, I don't think that uh uh i think you have to just be discerning that's all thanks um tal if i could maybe rephrase or restate the question ever so slightly for you. Um, not so much as uh, Judaism as a politic, but, but Zionism. Um, what is it that from your learnings you see is creating a, a far deeper connection as, as Zionists in Australia than it does for what we understand is happening in America? Um, so two, two things. One is I appreciate I appreciate the question, and I also appreciate what, what Nolan's saying, which is I think, um, and I will answer your question as well. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that we can certainly learn from other cultures, and we need to be looking outside of our world to see what are trends, what is working, and where are there challenges, and it, it's it's critical. Uh, I also agree with Noam in the sense that um, Australian jewelry. Um, uh, is we want Australia to, jury to have a seat at the table, much like everyone else, and we want them to come as they are. Um, so I, I want to say both of those things simultaneously. Um, relationship to Israel um, is is complicated in the United States, um, and I am. It's 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 fascinating being here and being in. You know the fact that um, your federation is called the Zionist Federation of Australia. In itself is uh, is is telling. Um, uh, I'm learning again by being uh, in this in this setting. Um, there is a different relationship uh, to Israel um, uh, nationally. There's a very strong, at least from what I'm experiencing here in this conference, about a, a, a relationship to Israel that is uh, uh, structured and supported nationally. Um, what American Judaism brings to the conversation is uh, both a challenge, but also uh, an interesting uh, a question, which is, what does it mean to be a Jewish people, and where does Israel, uh, what is Israel's role in this conversation? Um, I think that, um, and that's a question that we're that I think we're all engaged in asking. What is you know where where is? There's no question that Israel is central 
to, to Jewish life and to the Jewish world. Um, I think there's a question about um, what is the relationship between uh, world Jewry and Israel, and what is, how, how does that how does that map out? Um, I've had the the privilege of uh, studying um, with um, some experts on, on the notion of uh, you know what is Jewish peoplehood, uh, what does it mean to be an, a global Jewish people, and 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 one of the questions is you know what are the voices you know what is the weight of the different voices that come to the table. Uh, I don't think we have an answer yet. I think that um, um, there's no question that Israel, in whatever form it is, is critical to the Jewish people. And I think it's a question about, uh, I think that another question is like, how does Israel, uh, Mazin, uh, how is Israel impacted by, by world Jewry? So I think, that, again, I think that this tension um, that I think we are seeing in, in North America, again, can also be healthy in the sense that we are, we don't think things for granted. We know that relationship is real. Um, relationships are hard and relationships will be negotiated. Um, there will always be a connection between North American Jewelry and Israel. Um, I don't know what it'll look like in five years and 10 years, but I do tend to agree with Noam in the sense that um, North American Jewelry is so um, broad. There are so many voices. Um, that, and I think that the relationship is strong enough that we can make it through um, this, this hurdle. Um, I think that um, it, it may be, I don't know what the, the future relationship between Australia and Israel will be. Will it continue to be as smooth? Will there be bumps in the road? Um, but the one thing that we do know is that this relationship is critical to who we are as a people. Um, and I and I appreciate your question because uh, the more we can learn about um, the different relationships we have to Israel, the, the stronger we can be as a collect as as a collective. Um, I, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of you know trying to understand what it really means you know to be a global Jewish people, um, with Israel as a central piece of it, and how do we negotiate that, and how do we make sure that all voices are heard. So I didn't. I didn't give you a, a direct answer, um, but I, um, again, I, I, I'm positive. Um, the fact that the relationship right now between US specifically and Israel is has tension uh, is not necessarily, in my opinion, a bad thing. Uh, it means that we are, uh, we have some things to work out. Yeah, we, we all need to engage. Um, I think we have time for, for one final question from me um, and Noam, you, you have you have a, addressed this um, a little bit earlier. But a, a final question is: How do we better prepare our children for when they leave school and they they enter the world of student politics and and debate? And we know how confusing and frightening student politics can be. We know there's a um, the University of Melbourne. Uh, passed a resolution condemning Israel recently. Um, they were threatened with legal action by a non-Jewish person. Um, and rather than spend money on, on defending it, they decided to rescind the motion. But next week or this coming week, there's a new motion that's been put forward uh, condemning Israel as an apartheid state, the, the pariah of the world. How do we prepare our, our school students for that moment that they leave the school bubble? And we do uh, I think I, I have a view, and it's just be honest about Israel. It's not this panacea, but let's. I'd, I'd much rather hear from someone experienced and expert, far more expert than me. We do a few things. One is we don't make Israel education about Israel education. We make Israel education about Jewish education. Israel, like you said, Israel cannot become a substitute for Jewish education, and we need to make sure that our, our young people are, are learning about. Judaism and have what I said earlier, a very thick Jewish identity. When there are big challenges that come our way uh, and you have a really strong Jewish identity, a thick Jewish identity, when I say thick, I mean like having a Jewish identity that takes into account all the different aspects of the ecosystem I mentioned earlier, then what happens is when something difficult happens, whether it's BDS resolution is passed or apartheid uh, wall comes up on a campus, it just doesn't matter to you as much. It just doesn't affect you. It doesn't. You have you have a you have a, a thicker uh, a thicker shield. That's what you have. Um, then there's number two. I would say literacy. 
I can't tell you how many times, Jeff, how many times I go to an audience and I say to everyone, okay, students, 100 of you are right here right now. Right now, Israel's an apartheid state. And you hear that? What? Pause. What does it mean to be an apartheid state? And then the answer is, I have no idea what apartheid means, but I know I'm supposed to say it's bad for people to say that Israel's an apartheid state. So I'm. I, it's not just tongue in cheek. I don't think... I think that very often we as adults tend to think that what what our issues are or, or what their issues are. I was with a group of 150 high school teenagers this past week, right before right before I came to Australia. I was a scholar in residence at a sleepaway camp in, in, in the States. There were two kids out of 150 who even knew what boycott, divestment, and sanctions BDS was. Two kids. They had no idea about it. It wasn't part of their lexicon. They weren't thinking about it. So if we want them to know about it and to think about it and to reflect on it and to be prepared for it, then it has to enter our curriculum in a very serious way. The third thing is we have to really allow our young people um, to have a difference of opinions. We have to uh, acknowledge for ourselves that the battle that we face like many good Israel educators have said, our battle that we face is not a difference of opinions, it's indifference. Our battle is not antipathy for Israel, it's apathy for Israel. The number one question that I get very often is not how do I have my students really think about Israel, but how do I get my students to really care deeply about Israel? And the, the, the other aspect I would really start welcoming much more is the Overton window. The Overton window is the range of perspectives that are politically acceptable to a mainstream population. And we have to expand our Overton window to at least reflect what's in the Israeli government, in the Knesset. I don't think it's fair for, for us to demand from for our, our young people to stand in line with every specific thing that the Israeli government says. Now, we could... I might, I personally might agree with everything that the Israeli government says. That might really be my politics. But for to us to have an identity and to pass this identity on to our young people, we have to do a couple of things. And we do this in, in our content all the time. This is why I'm obsessed with it. I'm a shugala davar about it. And I, because I, I think it's, it's critical. Go to unpack that education. And what you'll see is the wide contours of dispute that exists within Israeli society. We bring that to the table. We want to make sure that you could be an Arut Sheva Jew, you could be a Haaretz Jew, and that neither one of those makes you a bad Jew. But make sure that you understand the different perspectives within Israeli society before you have that identity, and then all of a sudden you miss 75% of what you previously, you thought you knew everything. So if we do those things well, we expand the Overton window, we make sure that the battle is not a uh, difference of opinions, it's indifference, we make sure that we are not battling uh, antipathy, we're battling apathy, then I think that we'll be able to really have our young people in a very healthy and good place. And so um, to, to round it out, um, on um, for, from your perspective on visual education, most of these kids are getting their news feeds, the information from social media, which is all visual. And just, it hits home so quickly. And we know how the algorithms work. You go down the rabbit hole and that's where you start. How, um, your views on combating or, or, or just educating them and bringing them a balanced view? The most, I think, I, it's a very good question. Um, the most important thing I believe we can do is help our uh, young people um, become critical consumers of information and critical thinkers. And so, um, and this goes into visual literacy. You know, we're not only about, you know, what the question is uh, when you when you have information, um, what questions do you need to ask? This is very much in line with what it means to be for me to be Jewish, which is, you know, uh, where is this coming from? What is the agenda behind this? You know, we need, we need to make sure that, and again, I much like Noam, um, I, I think we um, need to trust this next generation to take us, I think that's what you said, Noam, to, to the next, um, to the next, to the next state of where we are. I, I trust them. What we need to do is to um, help them know how to na navigate uh, information. 
to know how to think about information, to know what questions to ask, to know what uh, vo voids to fill with their voices. Um, we don't need to be, the information they're gonna get, and they're gonna get it from many places. What to do with the information, uh, how to process it, and then how to use their voice uh, to, to move us forward. Those are the skills that we need to develop with our young people. Um, and so investing in who they are, and you know, this is something I think, you know, all, all, all of our work in education is how do we become, you know, functioning members of the 21st century. Uh, we really need to hone in on some very fundamental skills of what it means to be a productive member of society. Um, again, information is out there. Uh, we don't need to give information to young people. They have it, they can find it, it's gonna find them. What we can do is help them learn to negotiate with it, struggle with it. And ultimately my expectation is that they start to create. Um, they bring out their voice, um, having had those uh, experiences, having had that uh, opportunity to think. And that's where the hope is. Uh, again, I, uh, I, the, the, we can, uh, I have faith. We just need to make sure that we give them the skills so that they can bring their voice to the forefront. Uh, Thank you very much. I am gonna cut in here just um, because I wanna wrap things up, but I wanna say how incredible that was. Um, thank you so much. I'm very lucky because I get to hear our two speakers tomorrow at the second day of the Educators Conference. For those of you who are in Melbourne, I don't think you can register anymore, but if you can, you should. It's amazing. Um, our next ZFA conversation will be on the 18th of September. I will not be hosting it because I will be back in Israel for the first time in many years. So I'm thrilled by that. Um, Emily, if you're listening, you're up. Um, and, uh, and we're organizing a guest. I can't announce it yet, but it's very exciting. I spoke to him for the first time the other day and he's quite wonderful. And now let me just finish off with this. Um, I have to admit that that to me, be strong and of good courage was the advice that Cinderella's dying mother gave her in Disney's live action film a couple of years ago. That's where I thought it came from. I was a bit surprised when I was at Mount Scopus today and saw it on their logo. And I thought, well, maybe it's not Disney. Maybe it has some deeper meaning. And, uh, and here you are telling me that it actually comes from the Taurus and maybe my own Israel studies could do with a bit of work. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you to our two speakers tonight. Um, it was really, really interesting. Um, sleep well, and uh, and I will see two of you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Good night. Thank you very much.